what's up guys welcome to another astro video kind of <laughs> uh this one's just going to be a talkie video but i get a lot of questions about what are what do i use for astrophotography uh in terms of of lenses and what are where's a good place to start so we're going to kind of just go over all things astrophotography lenses this is right up front this is going to be uh purely canon based unfortunately that's that's what I shoot, that's what I have the most knowledge with. I will mention some third-party lenses that do translate to other systems as well, uh, but for the most part I'm going to be talking about Canon stuff because that's what I have and what I know. Although some of these principles definitely are not brand specific because I am going to go over like what makes a good or bad astro lens and that translates to anything. All right, so let's start with my favorite astro lens. Um, that's the lens that I think I've been using the most since it came out and it's relatively new, past couple of years maybe. I'm actually filming with it right now. It's the RF24 1.8. Uh, but I did make a video on using that for astrophotography and I'll, uh, quite a few of these I've actually made videos on or with. So you can check out my astrophotography playlist if you want to see or search those lenses uh, in my, my videos and you'll see those. But just overall, I love the 24 1.8. I love if I really need the ability to shoot at 1.8 that I can do that. Although I will say that I almost never shoot at 1.8 with that lens. Um, I basically I almost never shoot at wide open with like really fast lenses and that's because they tend to have a lot of coma so that's the first thing that we're going to talk about for astrophotography what makes a good what makes a lens good for astrophotography and that's how it handles something called coma so coma is lens is a, a type of lens distortion that will basically stretch the stars in the corners of the images so that they don't look round anymore they look like half moon shaped or you know just stretched wonky so that's not a good look and you can imagine why if you're doing astrophotography you don't want that um, however it's not as bad as it sounds because a lot of lenses even if they have bad coma it's usually only when they're wide open so usually if you stop them down in in the case of the 24 mil uh, if you stop it down to f 2.8 you're going to reduce like 60 to 70 percent of that coma and if you stop it down one more stop to f4 you're going to completely eliminate that coma so you can get a good balance of like you know still being kind of fast like f2.8 and having a, just a little bit of coma or you can you know go all the way to f4 stop it down to f4 and just completely eliminate the coma and that is typically what i do and the reason that I do that, like why, why would I have a 1.8 and not use it like wider open and, you know, why would I want to crank my ISO? Well, the, the easiest, simplest answer to that is I don't care anymore. I, I don't care what my ISO is for astrophotography because for one, the sensors of the mirrorless cameras are so much better than the DSLRs were. And the sensor on my R6 Mark II is just phenomenal. So that helps a lot. Uh, but even that in itself isn't good enough. The, the AI denoising that you can get these days, even the free one that comes in Lightroom and Photoshop is the absolute best. I just, I can't get over how amazing it is. I'm not saying that Photoshop's, I'm not saying that Adobe's AI denoising is the absolute best. I'm saying the AI denoising as a whole is just incredible. So whether you're using Adobe or Topaz or DxO Pure Raw or whatever, anything like that that has the AI denoising, it is just phenomenal. And I use it in everything. Uh, I, it has just opened up a whole new way of doing photography for me. And it's just taken a big weight off my shoulders for not having to care about what my ISO is because it'll clean it up. And then also typically in astrophotography, we don't care as much about ISO because we're usually going to stack images. So you can do plenty of shots like this with the Milky Way and all this kind of stuff where they're just single images and they're not stacked. And here, this is typically where you would care about the ISO. But again, with the denoising stuff, it makes even these signal images like just so much better. But stacking is a whole nother thing. We're not going to talk about that. We're getting away from lenses. I just, I want to preface this with like, it's okay to shoot astro with slower lenses, with lenses that aren't uh, super expensive and super fast and whatever. I'll tell you the other lens that I use the most. I do have it right over here. This is my very old EF 16 to 35 F4. 
I still love this lens. This is one of only two lenses that I have that are EF. The other one is that giant, right? Yeah, that, <laughs> that 500, which is also great for Astro. The 16 to 35 is one of the lenses that I use the most for Astro. I love it. It's, it's pretty sharp. It doesn't have that bad of coma, even wide open. So I do shoot it at F4 quite a lot and I use it a ton. It's, it's what I used for all of these, um, these two lenses, the 2418 and the 16 to 35 are what I used for these four images, um, from my last video from capturing the Aurora Borealis down here, way down here in New Mexico. That was incredible. But I used the 16 to 35 for this time lapse and I use it so much. The next lens that I use the most for Astro would probably be this guy. This is the RF 24 to 70 2.8. Wide open, that one has a little bit of coma, but it's not horrible. Um, I'll Sometimes I shoot it wide open and sometimes I stop it down to F4, but I use that one because it's a 24 to 70. So if I want a tighter shot, like at 50 or at 70, then I'll, I'll go there. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that one for Astro though, not for Astro solely, just because it's a giant, heavy, expensive, very expensive lens. And if you're just doing astrophotography, it's just simply not worth it. There, there are many better, cheaper lenses out there that um, are better and way more affordable. But it's just, the 2470 is a great all around lens. If I just wanna take one lens for a walk around and I might do some landscape, I might do some portrait, I might do some sports or action stuff, and I might do some astro. Well, it's all in one in that lens, so. That's, if you have something like that, the 24 to 105 F4 also, I don't have it anymore, uh, but I did. And I used to use that a lot as well, just simply for the convenience, but it does decent. Uh, it, def it definitely has some coma and it's not quite as sharp as that. The RF 15 to 35, I've used it a couple of times. It's an amazing lens. Again, I wouldn't recommend it for Astro solely just because of how expensive it is. If you do landscape and you do architecture or street photography or city stuff or real estate or whatever, then 1535 in your bag is great. It might be worth it in, you know, if, if you do a lot more stuff that would warrant a wide fast lens, but just for Astro, again, not worth it. It's too expensive. The RF 14 to 35 is one of my favorite lenses. I had it for a while. I sold it a while back because I needed the money for other lenses, uh, but I do plan on buying it again and trading in this. I'll probably trade in the, the 16 to 35 again <laughs> to get the 14 to 35, just to have that native mount. It's a little bit sharper. Um, it does great for Astro as well, and you get an extra two millimeters out of it on the wide end. So that's a great all around lens to have. It's one of my favorite for landscapes and for Astro stuff. Next up would be the 16, the RF 16 millimeter 2.8. Again, I had that lens and I sold it. I sold it to put the money towards the 14 to 35 at the time because I just wanted that lens more. It was more beneficial to me at the time. I wouldn't mind having the 16 to 35 again, just because it's so tiny and it's just, I could always keep it in the bag or heck even in a pocket or whatever if you needed it. So the size and weight of that thing is great. Uh, 2.8, I did review that lens as well for Astro, so you can check that out for and just see the images for yourself and all that. It does okay, but wide open, it's pretty bad uh, with the coma and stuff, and you, you definitely would probably wanna stop it down, and I always do, I always did when I had that lens, I always stopped it down, unless you're gonna crop in a lot. If you're gonna crop in, then you're gonna crop out the coma, then that's not a big deal. You can leave it wide open and get you that little ISO bump. But the 16 2.8 is a good budget lens uh, to start with. You know, it's the price really makes it attractive. But I will say that the one thing that ended up kind of driving me nuts about the lens and was one of the reasons why I ended up selling it, uh, and it's maybe not a huge deal to everybody, but like if you're going back and forth between scenarios where you need manual focus and electronic focus, autofocus, that's where the 16 kind of drives me nuts because it does not have a focus switch on the side of the lens. It's too small, apparently. And instead of putting a focus switch, Canon decided to put a switch to switch between the little RF ring and the focus ring. And I much would have preferred to have just a straight up focus switch on the lens because having to go into the camera and do it I find myself like forgetting to do it or just having to deal with the hassle of doing it. And it just, 
it's not a huge deal, especially for the price, you know, and it's a great lens. But that was just one thing that over time, after, you know, months of using it, it just kind of was annoying. But mostly I got rid of it because I wanted the 14 to 35. One of my other favorite lenses, uh, and I don't have this one anymore either because I gave it to a friend who just was in need, and that was the 35 1.8, the RF 35 1.8, very similar uh, to the 24 1.8. I really like 24 and 35 millimeter focal lengths for astro stuff. I just, I've kind of gotten away from shooting wider. Uh, and if I do shoot wider, then I often use, I often just do a pano, except for the other night when I was doing the Aurora shots, I really was wishing I still had that 14 or something even wider. Uh, and I did have my 16 millimeter and that was, that was good. I was very glad to have that. Um, but when you're, when you're doing stuff with like Aurora with, you know, it's like moving in a scene, doing panos is a lot harder because you, then you're having this time blend issue with, you know, the, the Aurora not like lining up and looking a little ugly if you have to do panos. So for Aurora, I tend to like, to like as wide as I can get. Other than that though, the 35 millimeter has the same, same deal. Um, it can do wide open at 1.8, but you're probably going to want to stop it down to 2.8 or F4 to get rid of that coma. But it's a fantastic lens. It's very, very sharp. It looks great. It's one of my favorite focal lengths for the Milky Way and for a lot of just uh, star trails and stuff like that. I love it. You can't go wrong with that. And it's decently priced, uh, you know, five, 600 bucks, I think. It's not hopefully break the bank. I know price is relative to everybody, but given the field that we're talking about, it's relatively affordable, that's for sure. I will also mention the Rokinon 14 millimeter. Um, I had that for a while. I had the RF version for a while, and that's great. I think if you want a wide angle, something for the RF, I think you should look at that, the Rokinon. Um, they make gray lenses. A lot of their wider stuff has a lot less coma than some of the Canon equivalents. And even the one that I had did have autofocus, but obviously you don't need autofocus when you're doing astrophotography. So uh, I also had the Rokinon 14 millimeter cinema lens and for a long time. And that one is also great, uh, low coma, and it's got a little wonky must, uh, mustache distortion in there, but it does have a profile on Adobe in Lightroom and Camera Raw that has been around for a long time that corrects it. So that's, that's not a huge deal either. The Rokinons though, they're a great option because they're, a, they're usually a lot more affordable and they have quite good quality glass, especially for astro purposes. I know a lot of people use like the Rokinon like 135 for longer astro stuff, deep space stuff. Excellent choice. You know, you, you can't go wrong with those. I do have, I do have this guy and I actually haven't tried this yet, but I am going to try it this summer. Uh, for some Milky Way stuff. This is the Lawa 90mm 2.8. Really great macro lens. Um, great image quality and all that stuff, but I haven't tried it. I suspect that it probably will have some coma and stuff like that, some yuckies in the corners at wide open. Uh, but at 90 millimeters, 2.8, especially if you're starting to use a tracker, uh, something like that can be really great. So I plan on maybe giving that a go at some point this summer. I don't know what, like maybe for the Galactic Core, uh, Lagoon, Trifid Nebula type stuff. I don't know, we'll see. Next up for me is this guy. I use, I use this lens a lot. This is my RF 70-200 F4. And I absolutely love that thing. It's very sharp. Uh, the coma is pretty manageable, wide open and I use it for deep space stuff, of course. Um, I have done a video where I used it without a tracker and shot some stuff, so if you wanna check that out and see like the process for stacking an image that hasn't been tracked and, and doing all that, I have a video on, on shooting, I think it might've been Orion's Nebula or something with that that was unstacked, I mean untracked, it was definitely stacked. But when you put that thing on a tracker, the reason I love it is because it's so light that it doesn't require a counterbalance for me. And I use, where is it? I'll show you. I use this guy. This is my Skywatcher Star Adventurer 2i Pro. And it comes with a, a counterbalance that you put on here and then you, you, so you can balance the weight out for heavier stuff. 
but I really don't like to use that because it really limits, it's a, it's a pain to reorient based on what composition and based on what target you want. So I, I try as hard as possible to not use a camera or setup heavy enough that would require a counterbalance for this. And the 70 to 200 on my R6 Mark II and R5 does not require a counterbalance for this. Although, I mean, it would help for sure. Like maybe I could squeeze an extra 30 seconds or something into a, a longer exposure, but I can get, you know, minute, I can get minute long up to two minute exposures if I get a really good polar alignment with this thing and the 70 to 200 with no counterbalance. All right, so for the RF system, I think, and all of the EF, I'm not gonna talk about the EF lenses, but there's plenty of them out there. The same rules apply, like just pay attention to, if you have a fast lens, you can shoot it wide open, but just check that coma, stop it down a stop or two if you can, and I guarantee you, you will get better images no matter what lenses you have. That's the biggest thing. The next biggest thing is learn how to focus your, your camera as well as you can, because that's obviously the next biggest killer for astro images is something being slightly out of focus. Uh, a little quick focusing tip is if you, you're shooting on a DSLR that can use live view or a mirrorless, then you can punch in with a magnifying glass, look at the brightest, any, any stars that you can see once you get your exposure uh, to where the stars show up on the back of the screen. When you're adjusting the manual focus, you will see it come into focus and go out of focus. What you're looking for is chromatic aberration. When you see that little pinpoint, that's a good sign. But when you see that pinpoint turn to like a red magenta um, color around it, that's like usually about as good as you're gonna be able to get it with manual focus. I know that doesn't cover every single lens out there. That just is basically what I know about and what I've used and my thoughts on kind of hopefully a broad enough range of lenses to give you a good idea of of where you wanna start. And just remember, stopping down is your friend. Don't worry so much about the ISO and learn how to denoise and learn how to edit. And I promise you, you'll start getting some good stuff. If you have any other lens recommendations for anybody that you know that works out really well for you or something that I missed, um, just leave those in the comments below. Definitely wanna check those out and you know, it just goes to help the community and all that. If you're enjoying the content, I really appreciate you sticking around this far. Hit that like button for me. It definitely makes a huge difference. It really helps the channel out. If you wanna support even more, you can check out my channel memberships. I've got extra content and I tend to have a lot more discussions with channel members and stuff like that. Massive, massive help to me from the channel members. So I really appreciate all the channel members. I've got preset packs, workshops. If, uh, if you wanna learn how to do this stuff with me in the field, you can either take a regular workshop or check out the private workshops where I do all over the Southwest and we cater to you and we go out during the nighttime and we can do whatever you wanna do. And a lot of great one-on-one -on -one, hands-on experience with editing as well. So links for all that stuff down below. If you haven't checked out the last video where I shot the Aurora in New Mexico, you should definitely check that out because that was pretty, I thought it was pretty cool. All right, that's it. I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.